In today's video, I'll be reviewing the Gearhead Archery B24. So earlier this year when I went to ATA, I wasn't entirely sure if I was even gonna get a new bow this year. Uh, I certainly didn't need one. The BX32 I was using last year, still totally fine, very happy with that bow. But I wanted to try something that was a little bit shorter axle to axle. A lot of times I get into areas where when I'm trying to figure out run and gun, which tree I wanna sit in and I'm looking to have a lot of cover around me, Sometimes it can make a difference just having a little bit less space up there. Sometimes it's totally fine. I tried to keep an open-minded ATA, shot a bunch of bows, and three that kind of met my criteria that I was pretty happy with were the Matthews VXR28, the APA Archery Mamba 28, and also the Gearhead 24. The 30 almost fit that criteria too, but I, I kind of felt like the 24 out of the ones I shot was like the smallest string angle I could go with and still be kind of happy with it. The Matthews, of course, once you got the stabilizers on it, is known for how well it holds. The APA probably had the most backcountry friendly features. And the Gearhead, at least the B series, is by far the most adjustable of them. And also offered the shortest, most compact package. So I ended up, after a couple weeks, deciding to get the B24. And it's important to mention that Gearhead offers a whole you know, gamut of different bows. They have the T-Series, which is the non-adjustable. You got a fixed draw length cam, fixed poundage, but it's the lightest weight. You can get it in carbon. Then they have the Disruptor Series, which has the addition of the limb pockets that are adjustable. You can adjust 15 pounds in your draw weight range, but it still is the fixed draw length cams. And then the B-Series is the most adjustable bow. This one, the cams are different. You have the 10 pounds of adjustability in the limb bolts, but then in terms of the cams, you have the options for either cable stops or limb stops or a combination of both. You have three different string posts to adjust how aggressive the draw cycle feels. With sliding mods, you can adjust without a bow press the draw length in half inch increments, and you got the adjustable grip to move that grip forward or back an inch and three quarter in a quarter inch increments or left and right three eighths of an inch in eighth inch increments. The riser comes standard in black anodized hard coat 7075 or you can get custom dip options for a little bit of extra cost and extra time. I decided with this bow just to go ahead and do a gutted paracord wrap. Not so much for the camo, uh, but more so just because if I bump anything against it, I just wanted to try that out, get a little bit of additional silencing and stealth you know, capabilities there. I also went ahead and just put stealth strips over basically anything that could possibly make contact. And that's something I do on just about every bow that I have anyway. So nothing too fancy there. Let's talk about the riser for a second. The obvious thing is that it has this very wide bridge design. And you'll see more and more, it seems like a lot of bow manufacturers are starting to get more of a bridged riser or a wider riser. A little bit of extra stability, extra stiffness. But I think the design, the way they have this here, is really about the best that you can get out there in terms of just kind of spreading that mass out to really improve your stiffness as much as possible. The other thing to notice with just kind of the riser shape is that the riser in comparison to the overall axle to axle length of the bow is pretty long. It's a whole lot of riser and just a little bit of limbs. Effectively, your limbs are gonna be the areas where you have a little bit more variability and manufacturing tolerances, things like that. Because of that, they're putting a lot of material in the area where it's gonna be stiff, high tolerance, and then leaving the you know, more variable limbs, so to speak, as smaller portions of that overall bow system. And you'll see that same type of design characteristic of a lot of other bows too. Everything is symmetrical, so you can shoot this left or right-handed. Without using a bow press, you can basically take off this whole grip assembly, flip it, take the stabilizer mounting holes, move them to the other side, and then the only thing you would need a bow press for is actually just flip the string around. The only kind of downside maybe to the bridge riser that I could find is that on a normal bow, if you go ahead and knock your arrow and just kind of let the arrow fall into the rest, if that's the way you do it. With a bridge riser, you do have to feed the arrow between the riser plates. That's one of the reasons I have the silencing material on the inside of the riser like I do, just so that I'm not gonna accidentally make any noise when I go to knock an arrow. And then with the grip, like I mentioned, it's an adjustable grip. So you can adjust this bow from anywhere between like a five inch brace height out to like a seven and a quarter. And you know, it kind of comes down to personal preference. Do you want to have a really short brace height? Obviously a little bit less forgiveness there, but you're able to store more energy in the bow, get you a little bit faster, arrow, higher kinetic energy, higher momentum, 
Or do you want maybe a little bit more forgiving setup, storing a little bit less energy in the bow by having a longer brace height and a shorter power stroke? Where I have mine set right now is about a six inch brace height. And then I just adjust the cams in order to get me just about spot on on the draw length where it feels comfortable and I'm able to shoot well and have good forgiveness. And then if I need even more fine tuning adjustment on my draw length, I can move that grip forward or back a quarter inch or I can adjust the length of my D-loop to get it absolutely just perfect. So a ton of adjustability there just in terms of how you can really fine tune your draw length. Now, if you're ordering from the website, you're getting this bow shipped to your door, you're gonna have some setup work to do, but things like the cam timing should already be on. If you're getting it from a pro shop, obviously they'll be able to do the initial setup for you. But basically, assuming the bow is in spec, meaning the axle to axle is in spec, cams are timed, you wanna start with the rust running right down the middle of the risers. And a quick and easy way to do that is just take two arrow shafts, lay them alongside this bridged riser, and then you got two nice parallel lines where you can really fine tune that rest position to get that arrow right dead center. And then assuming your draw length is set, you got that rest running right down the center, you got the arrow running through the center of the burger hole, or maybe a little bit higher, a little bit low, just depending on how you like it. You're running 90 degrees as a good starting point to tune this bow. You essentially come back to full draw, you shoot, and then you look at your tear. And then instead of having to do what you would normally have to do with a cam system like this and shim the cams, you can adjust the grip left or right. You don't need a bow press to do it. And you can ease out a lot of that tear and get bullet holes simply by moving that rest left and right. Now there's a couple different grip styles. You get the 1911 grip style, which is the same 1911 pistol grip design that's been around for years. That's actually what I have on this bow, but they also have a standard grip option, a carbon grip option. One of the things you can do as a really, really fine tune adjustment on the 1911 grip is because you can add or remove side plates, you can get thinner side plates, thicker side plates. You can put a thin side plate on one side and thick side plate on the other or vice versa to get even more kind of left and right travel in that grip if you want to. That was a, a tip that I picked up from somebody on the Gearhead Archery Fans Facebook page. For me, to be honest, I get the tear so that it is just about perfect, as perfect as I can get it. And then if I do need any little bit of adjustment after that, I'm fine with just moving that rest a hair to get just a perfect clean bullet hole. So let's talk a little bit more about this cam. Like I mentioned, you have the cable stops and then you can also adjust the hard limb stop. So you can get the exact kind of back wall you want and also get a little bit of fine tweaking on your draw length or just how that valley feels if you want more of a spongy back wall or a rock hard back wall. Or you can take those limb stops off entirely and just leave it with the cable stops. It's not gonna lock up on you. I mentioned that there's three different settings. There's an A setting, a B setting, and a C setting for the string posts. The B setting is kind of the standard. It's in the middle, it's what they ship it with, and it just gives you a nice, smooth, all-around draw cycle with a good balance of kind of ease of draw cycle and you know, stored energy. Whereas if you put it on the more aggressive C cycle, it effectively makes your string act a little bit longer. So you're gonna to need to adjust your grip to account for it. So when you have it on that more aggressive C cycle, you get a little bit more of a hump in the very beginning of the draw cycle, and then it drops back down to more of your normal draw cycle on the back half. So it's not like you're drawing and then it gets really hard right before you get to the back wall. It's that extra bit seems to be really kind of on the front end. You get over the hump and then it's back to normal. I actually found that when I shot a lot on the C setting, I shot really accurately. And it was really just a matter of, do I wanna try and get over that hump when I'm in the woods and I've been sitting there cold for three hours. So I have mine on the normal B setting right now. And I haven't really played around too much with the A setting, which is the most forgiving, but also the least energy storing. One interesting thing that I found also as we dive into string angle, especially in a short bow, it starts to matter more and more. If I have the bow on the C settings, I might be on draw bod number three. And if I have the cam set on the B setting, I might be on draw mod number five. And that makes the C setting a little bit more of a larger string angle. And the reason for that is because you're advancing that cam more the higher number you go. Draw mod nine is gonna have a shallower string angle than draw mod number one, for example. So that's something to keep in mind. Like I mentioned before, they make these bows all the way up to 36. If you think that there's a lot of cool features on a bow like this, but that the string angle on the short bow maybe just might not be for you, 
all the same stuff is built into their larger axle to axle models too but you might have even more of a forgiving overall setup and a little bit larger string angle if that's something you're more comfortable with i did do some speed testing the limbs are set 65 to 75 i had them right at about 72 pounds for this testing 29 and a half inch draw for me but for the purposes of the speed testing i did a bunch of different settings on that cam just to try and see what you guys could get and note that that was testing with a d-loop with the bomar nose button and also with a total peep which is a little bit heavier peep sight so it's more of an accurate bow hunting weight and i used more you know, i used heavier arrows basically for that testing for the way I have my hunting set up right now, at six inch brace height and a 29 and a half inch draw, I'm able to push that like 510 grain arrow a little bit over 270. And I'm able to push like a 545 grain arrow right around like 263-ish. I could obviously get more out of it if I went to a shorter brace height. I could get more out of it if I went to the C setting on the cam, but this is just kind of a nice happy medium for me. I feel like it's still pretty forgiving and it's easy to draw back when I'm cold. And so that's why I have it set the way I do right now. For me, it seemed like the biggest learning curve was just for me learning how to deal with a little bit smaller string angle. And something that was really helpful in that endeavor was actually adding that larger size of the Bomar nose button. Cause then I'm still able to put my arrow right where I normally would between my lip and my chin. And I'm able to just put the very tip of my nose on that Bomar nose button. And then that effectively gives you a couple extra degrees of string angle. So that made that a little bit easier, but I'm still able to get a very rock solid position here. And the biggest mistake that I had is I was playing around all these different settings and stuff. I tried shooting it in a whole bunch of different cam settings to see what I liked the best was if I had a setting where I was overextended a little bit and a little bit too far back, that's when I would really start to struggle. So let's say the string angle is small and you end up overdrawing to get that string to your nose. Now you're in a, a, like an overextended position. You're not as solid on the back wall. It's harder to pull through your shot. And for me, that was when I started to feel like, man, I don't know what's going on. I'm just not shooting that well. My pin float might be like this, but my group would be like this at long range. And it was really just fine tuning that actual draw length to get it exactly where I needed it to be. And once I was able to do that and hit that sweet spot, then I was like, okay, now the tuning's working. My pin float is even tighter. I'm shooting within the pin float, meaning if my pin is floating around a, you know, an area this big on the target, my arrows are at least grouping like that or even smaller. So that's again, how I would kind of gauge if my draw length was set appropriately. And if I had all the settings in a way that's gonna work for me, you know, we're talking nice calm day if my arrows, if I'm getting weird flyers where it felt like a good shot, but the arrow didn't indicate it, then that would also kind of indicate to me that maybe something's not quite right here. So I would say from a forgiveness standpoint, if you're not used to shooting a short string angle bow like this, and that's causing you to struggle with finding a consistent anchor, or it's causing you to either over or under draw a little bit, then from that perspective, I could see it being less forgiving. If you're able to get everything dialed in, I personally feel like when I'm shooting at say 80 yards and I am trying to quantify how good my pin float is and I'm trying to compare that against other bows that I've had in the past, this thing for me on calm conditions will hold just about as good as any other bow that I've had. And I would say bare bow with no stabilizers or anything, it probably holds, if anything, maybe a little bit better. When you get them all set up exactly right with the stabilizers and everything, you can obviously get really good holding out of all of them. And the same is true with this. If I added a sidebar and a front bar and played around with the weights, I could bring that pin float in even tighter. Not so much on the really crystal clear, calm, good shooting days, but when I would get those days where I'm either just, I'm just not myself or maybe I had you know, too much coffee or whatever, that's when adding the extra weight and the stabilization really made a difference. For me, when I'm kind of looking at the numbers on that and just kind of balancing the pros and cons of having that all rigged into my overall setup, I mean, let's be honest, this for me, I bought this bow to be a whitetail close quarter setup. My whole world is 30 yards and in. And if I know that my groups are X percent better at super long distances, but that at 20, 25, 30, 15 yards, I can hardly tell the difference. Then for me, I just as soon, you know, leave it off. And I feel like the way I have this thing set up now, I haven't made any changes to it. It is just, it's driving tax. I feel very confident in it. 
realistically, I'd probably be fine with either the 24 or the 30. The 30 might be kind of an all around better, you know, a little bit bigger string angle, maybe a little bit better holding, just a hair heavier. That would be, I think, a good option. Also, if you're the kind of guy who likes to have a quiver of arrows on the bow while you're hunting, then obviously if you've got the 30, you're not gonna have your arrows extending beyond the length of the bow. As you can see right now on the 24, this arrow is a 27 and a half inches. You add a quiver hood to that and it's a little bit longer than the bow. Depending on your draw length and how long your arrows are, if you plan on hunting with a quiver on, there's probably not too many advantages with going with a super, super short bow because ultimately at the end of the day, your quiver of arrows is gonna be the longest thing on there. After shooting this bow at 24 inches ATA, I'd be really curious to see kind of how, say something like the 34 would shoot, for example, if it's got all the same features built into it, but just a longer axle to axle. Uh, I'd like to shoot one for a little bit and just see kind of how it compares. But overall, I've been pretty happy with how this performs. A short bow like this might not be for everybody. Let's just be upfront about that. Like I mentioned, it, it took me a little bit to really figure out exactly how I want to get my draw length, how I want to get my anchor set up, all of that for the, the shorter ATA. Uh, but in terms of you know exactly what size, what model and things like that might suit you the best, what I would recommend is seeing if you can get the opportunity to shoot their lineup. They'll set up booths at various shows. Obviously this year was you know, a little bit different than most years. They're not the biggest brand out there, so they're not gonna be in every pro shop across the country, but I would definitely recommend if you do got the opportunity to try them out beforehand, then that'll help you kind of figure out for you what might be the best option. With the 24, the way I have it set up right now, I feel confident enough in it that if I do have any kind of issues this year, if I miss or have a bad shot or whatever, it's gonna be on this guy, not the bow, uh, which is the way I like to have it. Regardless of what bow I'm shooting, I like to have it set up so well that I have nobody to blame but myself, and it's all on me. I, I don't wanna have equipment failure or lack of forgiveness or something like that ever become an issue for me. So my guess is I probably would have been also happy with say like maybe the VXR or maybe even the, the Mamba, but I mean, for me to really be able to speak to a bow I can't just shoot it a few times at five yards and say, oh yeah, this is the one for me. I have to be able to kind of play around with it for weeks and shoot it in various conditions to really start to build my opinion. So in conclusion, my thoughts on, I guess, first of all, gearhead overall, the, between the bows that I've shot and also this one that I've had a lot more time to actually play around with over the course of several months. I think that they have an underrated design in terms of just kind of being able to have all of the adjustability that you want in a bow with something like the B-Series, have that nice, stiff, bridged riser, or have the option to get something that's you know, super ultralight like the, a Carbon T-Series or something like that. They're easy to tune, so I would definitely recommend if you have the opportunity and you're looking for a new bow, don't write them off. I would definitely go ahead and check them out, see what you guys think and you know, hopefully be able to shoot like the gamut of their bows and compare to other bows before you end up making a final decision. Because I do think they're, they're worth having on the, the list of options. And then in regards specifically to the B24, I personally like the amount of adjustability here just because I like to tinker with stuff. I like to play around with you know, the fine little variables that could make little differences here and there. Because of the length of my arrows and the quiver, I'm probably not gonna hunt with a quiver on my bow. I'll take it off once I get in the tree and set it on the side. Where I see this making the biggest difference, having a shorter bow is if I'm tucked into say an oak tree or an aspen, or I wanna be able to shoot over the top of my camera arm, then that little bit shallower string angle is gonna give me some opportunities where it's gonna be helpful. You know, throw evergreen trees into that mix too. If I wanna hunt out of like a tamarack or something, they got branches everywhere. It's certainly not a hard requirement, I think, to, to hunt, obviously, with a short bow. You know, I hunted more days last year with a traditional bow than I did a compound. And when I'm sitting there looking at which tree to pick, and I'm thinking about how I want to set up in that tree, there were definitely times where I'm thinking, yeah, that might not be the best option just because of the overall length of the bow. I got to be able to maybe sit here instead. And so this just gives me a little bit more flexibility. I can sit flat on the ground up against like a tree if I want to, like I'm turkey hunting with a shotgun. And I can draw back and shoot without any worries of the cam hitting the ground. So I definitely think there's some advantages to a short bow, but you should also be honest with yourself in terms of what you think might be the most forgiving for you too. Because obviously if you take the same features in a short bow and then you make it longer, then all things being equal, 
you should get more forgiveness. If you're a smaller person, shorter draw length, then your experience with a 24 or 20 inch bow is gonna be different than somebody my size, and it's gonna be different than somebody's experience who's you know 6'3 and has monkey arms. But at the end of the day, I'm pretty happy with this one. And I would say that for me, the 24 and the 30, for, I think for a large range of people, is probably, one of those two is probably gonna fit within the sweet spot. And for the longer ones, like the 34 and the 36, if, you're, if you know you're a long ATA person, I would definitely check those out too, in addition to everything else that you're kind of evaluating. So I hope this video was helpful for you guys. This is the bow that I'll be hunting whitetails with this year. Hope this answered some questions, hope it was helpful. Uh, if you have any additional questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section down below. And thanks for watching.